Located in the heart of the community, the Brooklyn Schoolyard is one of the finest schoolyard developments in all of Canada. However, the Brooklyn Schoolyard development did not occur overnight. In fact, it took over four years of hard work on the part of the residents of the community to bring this playground about. My name is Harry Finnegan, and I worked as a community planner with the Brooklyn's residents for over four and a half years. I would like to tell you the story behind this schoolyard development. The neighborhood of Brooklyn's is less than a square mile in size. It is located in the northwestern part of the city of Winnipeg, about a 15 minute drive from the city's downtown area. Brooklyn's is surrounded by four busy streets and a fair amount of industrial and commercial development. As such, it has evolved as a fairly isolated residential area with its own distinct character and identity. The first houses were built in Brooklyn's at the turn of the century. People were attracted to it by the promise of low taxes, lack of development control, and the right to keep farm animals. For years, the Brooklyn's area, with its largely Anglo-Saxon population, boasted some of the most successful soccer teams in all of Manitoba, such as the senior team of 1916. The community underwent considerable change during the 1920s, with many Eastern European immigrants settling in the district. Many of the early Brooklyn's residents managed to find jobs in the nearby CPR rail yards and shops of Weston. Like so many communities, the school in Brooklyn's played an important role in the lives of the people in the area. The main school, which was built in 1911 out of red brick, was generally referred to as the Red School. On its 50th anniversary, it was officially named after Stephen Krawchuk, who had been its principal from 1933 to 1943, and who later became the area's MLA. In 1937, Krawchuk's school became the site of a momentous meeting for the then village of Brooklyn's. Members of the Brooklyn's Ratepayers Association packed the school hall, where after a somewhat heated debate, they endorsed the idea of introducing a sewer and water system into the area. Unfortunately, due to the high costs involved, it took some 20 years and many more heated debates for the idea to become a reality. Brooklyn's heyday seemed to occur in 1961, when with a population of just under 4,400 and the school bulging at the seams with over 1,100 students, it officially became a town. It continued to run its own affairs and to operate its own municipal services, including a volunteer fire department, right up until 1967, when it amalgamated with the city of St. James. Brooklyn's and St. James later became part of the city of Winnipeg through the provincial government's controversial unicity legislation of 1971. Brooklyn's experienced a steady decline in its population from 1961 through to 1976, when it stood at approximately 3,000 people. In many ways, it found itself lagging behind the rest of the city of Winnipeg. It had few finished streets, numerous open ditches, and an abundance of poor quality housing, some of which had remained vacant for many years. It also offered few recreational opportunities. In order to help stem this declining population trend and to provide much needed support services to the community, the City of Winnipeg initiated the establishment of a Neighborhood Improvement Program, or NIP, in Brooklyn's. NIP, a federal, provincial, and municipally funded program, was established in the early 1970s to help in revitalizing neighborhoods such as Brooklyn's. The Brooklyn's NIP budget, with $4.9 million, was to be spent over a five-year period. In 1977, the City of Winnipeg established a community planning office here in Butterworth School which is centrally located in the neighborhood, right across the street from the older Krawchuk School. NIP staff were hired to introduce the program to the community, to encourage citizen participation, and to work with the Brooklyn's residents to ensure that the monies were spent on projects which the community wanted. By the spring of 1978, the Brooklyn's NIP resident committee was established. This committee consisted of 21 people who had been elected at meetings throughout the neighborhood. The committee quickly identified the Brooklyn Schoolyard as one site with a lot of potential for the community. Centrally located in the community, a short block away from the community center, 
adjacent to the library and the proposed site of a new indoor swimming pool, the schoolyard covered an area of approximately seven acres. It was described by some residents as nothing more than a barren wasteland. Krawcheck School, located on the northern part of the yard, housed the nursery school together with the kindergarten to grade four school program. To the south was located Butterworth School with grades five to nine together with the Brooklyn's daycare center. The two schools had a total enrollment of about 400 students. Early in 1979, MIPS staff initiated a series of meetings with various groups and individuals which had a particular interest in the schoolyard. Meetings were held with the parent council and school staff, including the principals and teachers as well as the custodians. Students in each class in the two schools were also consulted as to the changes they would like to see made to their schoolyard. In order to provide everyone in the neighborhood with a chance to have a say in the development of the schoolyard, a questionnaire was delivered door to door throughout Brooklyn's. This map of the schoolyard outlines some of the concerns and ideas which were received from the questionnaire, as well as from the various meetings which had been held. The red stars on the map outline two major problems which were identified by some residents. The first problem had to do with the fact that two hydro poles were located on the west side of Krawcheck School, right in the middle of the schoolyard. Because there was general agreement that these poles presented a potential hazard in the yard, the NIP resident committee was able to use NIP funds to have them removed and to provide an underground power service for the school. The second major problem was more controversial. It had to do with the traffic on Pacific Avenue and the fact that students in Butterworth School had to cross the street to get to and from the schoolyard. Concerns expressed here related to the nature of the traffic on Pacific Avenue. Because Pacific was a very wide street, it tended to be used illegally as both a truck route as well as a drag strip. With these various concerns in hand, the new president committee approached the University of Manitoba's Department of Landscape Architecture for assistance. From the beginning, Victor Callis, a second year master's student, agreed to adopt the schoolyard project as his thesis topic. Victor took the various ideas that had been put forth to date and incorporated them into an initial concept plan for the schoolyard. One of the key elements of the plan called for the closure of Pacific Avenue between the two schools. The plan was presented at a public meeting at Krawcheck School in April 1979. For those residents who were unable to attend, an attempt was made to bring the public meeting to them through the production of a special television program on cable TV. Because it was seen as a major issue, the proposed closure of Pacific Avenue was emphasized. Following the program, Brooklyn's residents were encouraged to phone the NIP office where members of the resident committee were on hand to record their comments, which turned out to be very supportive. Over the following months, Victor continued with his research, taking note of how teachers made use of the schoolyard, observing the children at play, meeting with them in the classroom, consulting with school staff, and presenting alternative plans and ideas at public meetings in the neighborhood. In December 1979, Victor presented his final report to the NIP President Committee. In this report, Victor presented two alternative concept plans which he had drawn up for the schoolyard. The plans differed in that one allowed for Pacific Avenue to remain open, while the other called for the closure of Pacific Avenue and the integration of the street space into the final schoolyard development. Because he felt that it would provide a superior community facility, Victor recommended that the committee approve this plan in principle and that they seek a temporary four-month closure of Pacific Avenue to determine its effects on traffic. The resident committee adopted Victor's recommendation and earmarked $700,000 of NIP funds for the schoolyard development. It also sought and received approval in principle for this master conceptual plan from both the St. James Assiniboia School Division as well as the City of Winnipeg. At this time, Extensive negotiations took place between the school board and the city to work out an ongoing joint use agreement. The NIP President Committee then formally approached the St. James Assiniboia Community Committee to apply to have the street closed on a trial basis. A group of residents in opposition to the idea of closing the street
petitioned the community committee. The new president committee then agreed to have a meeting with the petitioners. That meeting was held here at Krawczyk School. Realizing that the closure of the street was only for a trial period, the majority of the petitioners who attended the meeting formally endorsed the planned approach. The resident committee arranged to have the laneway on the west side of Butterworth School extended from Pacific Avenue right across the school board's property to Ross Avenue to the south. It was hoped that once this lane was in place, the disruption of internal neighborhood traffic caused by the closure of Pacific Avenue would be kept to a minimum. Once the city of Winnipeg had taken traffic counts on all the streets in the area, the resident committee held the community work festival through which Brooklyn's residents were invited to come out and to help to transform the street into a park space. During this work festival, the residents themselves were the ones to set up the temporary barricades. Planters and park benches, which were available at no cost from the city's storage yard, were erected and revitalized. During this trial closure period, many residents, particularly the school children, had a chance to enjoy the recreational opportunities provided by the street space. Further traffic counts were conducted on Pacific Avenue and the adjacent streets to determine how this closure had in fact affected traffic in the neighborhood. In the meantime, the resident committee selected the firm of Hilderman Fair Witte and Associates to review these traffic counts and to coordinate the detailed planning and design tasks for the project. Dave Witte, a senior partner in the firm, served as project manager. Received by the school board. The study of this type that takes a great deal of time and a great deal of effort and involves a wide variety of people, citizens from the area, committees, the politicians in the city as a whole, as well as various government departments. It requires a, a structure, a structure that allows people to understand how they will participate, how decisions will be made, and where the, where the study is headed. It's not a hard structure that causes people to feel uncomfortable, but really one that's flexible, sets out targets and dates, and indicates when we're going to do certain things. Brooklyn's involved a large process, one with quite a few people with many interests. And so we developed a process chart, set out target dates and various targets or uh, meeting times when we thought that we should get together and review material. We also included within that uh, process some of the major types of information that we would need in order to make good decisions, decisions that people would be comfortable with. On this particular process, you'll see various yellow-coated points. These are points where we felt at the start of the study we would have to have community participation. As the study progressed, in fact, we had more points of community participation. But at the very beginning, before we actually undertook the work, we were able to set out what we thought was going to be the necessary process, one that would involve all of us, including ourselves as consultants. By doing this, at the very start, the committees, the citizens, and others who were involved understood what would be expected of them, the roles and responsibilities. The key point to remember is that this structure did not dictate the study at all. It assisted in developing sound decisions, decisions that people felt comfortable with. As we 
moved through the, de the process, we came to a, a critical decision point. And that's where the community of Brooklyn's came together to review whether Pacific Avenue should be closed or not. That decision took place in October of 1980. And it was based on information that we were able to compile over four months of, of street closure. Information indicated that, that uh, there were some major advantages to street closure. Opinion varied in the community. Brooklyn's, however, had to make a decision, and the community came together to decide on which way they wanted to go. I'm Mrs. Morris. I live on the corner of Ada and Alexander, which is becoming quite a speedway. You say that the traffic has decreased by 20%. What I'd like to know is, where's that 80% going? I'll tell you, it's coming down Alexander and Ada. And, and it's Ross, no. what, and Ross, pardon me, what speed is that traffic? You've clocked and you've said, okay, there's so many cars going down there. But I'll tell you, a good half to three quarters of those cars are not doing the legal speed limit. And it's a danger to my house and property. What I don't think some of you realize is from the statistics given here that we've just eliminated 1,400 chances for your children not to get hit on Pacific Avenue. Nobody did get also hit on Pacific Avenue. Right? The issue was not resolved at this meeting, and it was basically left to the NIP resident committee to make a decision. At its subsequent meeting, and after considerable debate, the resident committee decided to apply for a permanent closure of Pacific Avenue. While various city departments, such as the fire department, reviewed the application, we thought that we should move forward with some of the less contentious areas, such as the area of the east of Krawchuk schoolyard. It was in this area that Victor envisioned a large play structure for the younger children in Krawchuk School, an amphitheater for outdoor classes, a natural prairie grass area, a quieter sitting area by the library with a horseshoe pitch for the adults and older children, a large hill for sliding, a garden area, and a water feature. As it turned out, this water feature became a contentious issue in itself. And this was a result of the fact that the school board felt that water wasn't an appropriate feature to have in a schoolyard. However, the citizens of Brooklands had indicated very strongly they, that they supported Victor's plan and proposal for a pond area that could be incorporated into the education program of the school, as well as a, an area that could be used by the children during the summer months. It was our job to try and bring these two sides together and resolve this contentious issue. Dave was able to work out much of the detail through regular meetings of the schoolyard planning committee, which was made up of representatives from the school, principals, teachers, students, and representatives from the parent council, the NIP resident committee, the daycare center, school division, NIP staff, and the city of Winnipeg's parks and recreation department. In other words, all groups with an interest in the yard were represented on this committee. Well, on Gallagher, there was water on each side of the track, by the, by the track. And the kids played in there, they built a raft, and they uh, were on top of it. And nobody got drowned there. We got this constant phone calls from people saying, put up your fences around retention ponds, and mm. all the counselors are looking at it. But the point being is, where do we draw a line? We have rivers running all through the city, creeks, everything. We're going to fence every river and every creek. And so that was the problem. So there, this happens all the time. All of a sudden we want to make something, you know, that we can control. <laughs> and we had Gallagher. dishes full of water three feet deep and no one did anything about it. Now everyone's up now to get about water. In order to try to improve communications, a joint workshop was organized for members of the school board and the NIP resident committee. The workshop, which was held at Krawchuk School, reviewed the overall plan. Sending out, but we want to hold off on that until we have the meeting on the 26th, because that'll give us some ideas and the sort of questions we want to ask. Now, before you go too far, yes, uh, you know, for example, with the pool, as I mentioned yes. to you, yeah. officially the school board is against having a pool at the moment, and that's recorded in their right. minutes. Well, for a number of reasons, mm -hmm. the reasons they gave at the time was the question of the uh, safe possible danger to the very small children. We took the various ideas generated by the schoolyard planning committee, the special workshop of the school board, and a number of community meetings, and we revised the plans accordingly. We then took these plans 
to what we viewed as the decision-making group for Brooklyn's and the schoolyard, and that was the Brooklyn's Neighborhood Improvement Residence Committee. There's a motion for $180 to be spent for the screens, and you wanted to second, second it. Okay. Any <coughs> further discussion on it? Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. In spite of all these meetings and discussions, serious opposition to the proposed street closure surfaced. At Winnipeg City Council's meeting in June of 1981, a longtime resident of the Brooklyn's area decided to appear before City Council to oppose the street closure. Pacific Avenue, for those who are not familiar with it, is one of the widest streets in the area. It has a school on each side of it, I admit, and they want to build a playground in the middle of the road. I was taught when I was a boy, don't play in the middle of the road. So I think myself, they should take away this blockade and make it look like a proper street again. Council decided to refer the matter back to the community for clarification. Both sides to the issue decided to organize community-wide petitions. They took their petitions to City Hall and presented them to City Council at its meeting the following month. The consistent request to community committee and to council has been to close that section of the street. Now, Mr. Mayor, I'm, uh, we have had the two petitions sent, uh, put before us. There is, uh, as I mentioned, a thousand names favoring closure and 700 odd opposing it. But really, the ball has been placed in our court to make a decision. Uh, I, have, I have indicated in view of the, uh, of the amount of signatures that the bylaw should be passed and the street should be closed. It makes them, whatever decision we make is not going to be accepted by the whole community, and that's, uh, that is an unfortunate event. Councillors Balsillie, Burt. City Council voted Gary overwhelmingly in favor of the street closure. Gary Shortly thereafter, Johnson. a contractor was hired and construction began. The next few months saw a lot of construction activity in the yard. In keeping with the NIP resident committee's desire to involve the community in the construction of the yard, a workday was held in October 1981. Snow came early that year, but it wasn't enough to dampen the spirits of residents who came out in full force to help with the planting and construction work. By the summer of 1982, most of the construction work was completed on the Brooklyn schoolyard and the children finally had a chance to use some of the features which had been talked about for so long. The official opening of the schoolyard was held on June 19, 1982. Rain forced the ceremonies inside. Father Rudichuk, a priest in the neighborhood, was invited to give the invocation. Well, Lord Jesus, Lord of Lord and Kings of Kings, we ask you to, uh, to cast the mantle of your protection over these recreational, facil recreational facilities, over these playgrounds, this park. We ask you to be with all of us to protect and guide all those who make use of them. We ask you, Lord Jesus, also to heal any wounds or misunderstandings there may be in the community with regard to this park, that truly we may have unity and understanding and true fellowship in our community. Warmth of feeling in the Brooklyn's community is such that it Bill Norrie, the mayor of Winnipeg, was also invited to say a few words. It's raining or whether it's dry, there's a very real community feeling in Brooklyn's and that's what the park has brought together. We've got a town square, we've got a community center in a sense that we will all come together on and particularly for the young people and the children that we have here today in such numbers and it's really great to see them. The choir was phenomenal. Uh, I think that that's really, that's really what it's all about. So ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege and a great pleasure for me to have been asked and to be given the official duty and the very real pleasure to officially uh, unveil the plaque naming Brooklyn's Park.
One year after the official opening, I returned to Brooklands to talk to some of the residents and school staff who had been particularly involved in the process. We have a lot of people that uh, have guests over and you'll find that they'll come down to either show it off or people have heard about it and want to come and see it and you will see a lot of families down here you know pointing out different aspects of the area and things that they've um, maybe even helped put together by the uh, community involvement days and things like that uh, certain people say, you know, this is a tree I planted, especially the younger people, the children, you know, say, look, Daddy, I planted this tree, sort of thing, you know. I've been teaching here at Krawchuk for six years. When I first came, look, uh, went out of recess, it looked more like a battlefield than it did a playground. Uh, somebody said the children didn't have anything to play on, so they used each other as play equipment. And uh, we tried various things to amuse them, but basically one teacher or two teachers couldn't do enough to keep that many children busy. And so in the planning of the playground, the idea was to find things that would give the children a, a creative outlet, a very physical outlet. And what we find now is that there's enough going on on the playground. The children just don't have time, really, to get into fights. Similarly, there's a lot of creative outlet for the teachers. For instance, I find that the amphitheater area, I enjoy teaching French in that situation. We can sing or do things as loudly as we want, enjoy ourselves without bothering any other teacher or class. And the whole area with the pine trees and the grass is beautiful for reading stories to children. Looking back, the long process that uh, we followed, was it, was it worthwhile? Do you think it was necessary? <clears throat> as far as the, it being a long process, I would certainly recommend it. Uh, I felt that uh, because we took our time with it, we gave everyone an opportunity to uh, look at the plans, to discuss it, and even have an opportunity to think a while about it, uh, that uh, this was certainly the best way to go. It took four years from the time that the Brooklyn schoolyard development had simply been an idea shared by a number of residents in the area until it was finally completed. There can be no doubt that the development created a lot of excitement and some hard feelings in the community. However, changing the shape of a neighborhood to such a radical extent is bound to result in some conflict. When all is said and done, perhaps the best ones to judge whether or not this development is in fact a success are its main users, the children.